Hi, my name is Chase Heibel, and I am the product manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific in charge of our laboratory, refrigerators, and freezers. Today, I'll go through the mechanics of one of the most fundamental pieces of laboratory equipment, the freezer. Freezers in the lab can easily be forgotten and overlooked as they spend most of their life sitting with their doors closed, silent. But when the right type is not selected originally for the lab, they can be a constant source of disruption. For this reason, it is very important to know what type of freezer is right for your space. But before looking at the various sizes, tiers, features, and configurations there are, it is first key to know one simple question, manual or auto defrost. Ask any researcher, clinician, or engineer their opinion on what is best, and you'll get many different reasons why one or the other is the best solution. The simple answer is, both are the best option, depending on what you are using them for. First, let's take a look at the function of the manual defrost freezer. This is what we call a negative 80 ULT style freezer. Specifically, it's a TSX 700 ULT, but it functions very similar to other manual defrost freezers, like our TSX negative 20 manual defrost freezers. All freezers have two main components that they use to cool a device that cools a medium, in most cases the device is a compressor and the medium is a refrigerant, and a device to transfer heat from the cabinet to the medium. In most cases, that is an evaporator coil that contains the refrigerant. For manual defrost freezers, they cool by circulating the cold refrigerant through coils in the wall. And in some freezers, those coils are located in the shelves. Those are typically simpler models. As the refrigerant moves through the coils in the walls, they absorb the energy or heat from the air and product in the cabinet. The internal temperature differential causes the cold air to circulate, resulting in stable cabinet temperature when the door is closed. Although places closer to the wall can be colder than the rest of the freezer. The cold refrigerant generally enters the coils from the top of the cabinet and work their way downward, meaning heat removal is happening first at the top and then the refrigerant warms as it goes down. This is typically why you see ice buildup the most at the top of the cabinet because it's the coldest point. Moisture ice accumulates fastest at the coldest point. As the ice accumulates over time, it creates a barrier between the refrigerant and the cabinet. The barrier hampers the transfer of energy over time and will impact the system's ability to cool effectively. The ice also makes it more difficult to load and unload cargo, especially when it becomes excessive and reduces the usable space. That is why it's important to defrost these units routinely, and this process is manual, as the name suggests. The process for all manual defrost freezers is pretty much the same across the board. The steps are prep a temporary space for where you're going to move your product like another freezer, transfer product batch by batch, letting that freezer recover back to temp between each load. Prep a space around the freezer itself with towels, pads, and other means to collect the water runoff. Power off the unit either by going through commands on the screen or by unplugging the unit and then clean up the water afterwards. Once all the moisture is removed, the freezer can be powered back on. That is how manual defrost freezers work. It's pretty simple. If we shift over to an auto defrost freezer, here we can see a TSX series high performance unit. They have the same two main devices, a compressor and evaporator coils, but they work very similarly to refrigerators instead of manual defrost freezers and that all those cold coils we talked about in the manual defrost freezers are what are called an evaporator housing. Fans push air across these coils and down into the cabinet, creating a continuous air loop in the cabinet where warmer air is drawn in and colder air is pushed out. If we look closer at the components within that housing, we will find a few common parts. Fans, which are used to move the air, evaporator coils, which is where the cold refrigerant is, and a heater, which is used to remove ice from the coils. The coils in this case look a lot like a radiator in a car and function the same way. 
there are hundreds of tiny fins in a grid that maximize the surface area between the refrigerant and the air pushing over it. The heater only heats up the evaporator coils, not the entire unit. So ice will only be removed from that housing. However, since this is the coldest spot and air is being pushed over these coils constantly, these coils are where a vast majority of ice buildup occurs. Like manual defrost freezers, ice needs to be removed. And in the case of auto defrost freezers, if that ice is not removed, it can have much more dramatic impact on the performance of the unit. During defrost, the fans shut off as not to push air across the warm heaters and into the cabinet. And finally, a drain line an evaporator tray collects all that melted ice and transfers it out of the unit to be evaporated into the room. But not all auto defrost freezers function the same nor have the same level of precision and control. The most basic type of auto defrost freezers only look at time. When the design is developed, a company will look at how long ice typically takes to build up on the evaporator coils. They then determine the average time it takes to remove that ice. Generally, both are given safe buffers to ensure all ice is removed. Unfortunately, what this means is that the unit has no real understanding of what the defrost process is doing to the temperature inside the unit. Time-based systems typically have very wide performance, causing temperatures inside the cabinet to potentially reach zero C. A big pro of these systems, though, is that they are simple and less expensive to build. Next are time and temp-based systems. For these units, they look at both the time between the defrost, but also the temperature of the evaporator. In this case, a unit will enter defrost and then stop defrost once a specific temp is achieved for the evaporator. Unfortunately, while it is looking more at real-world conditions inside the evaporator, it isn't looking at performance in the cabinet and how the defrost process is impacting that. These types of systems are found in a lot of general purpose freezers used for routine lab work as they give better performance, but not great performance. The last group are adaptive defrost, which is what the TSX series employs. These units look at time, temp, ambient conditions, door opening events, cabinet temperatures, set points, and other parameters to determine when they should defrost and for how long. And in these TSX units, they use the hot gas discharge from the compressor to heat the coils, effectively utilizing heat already being created by the system to warm the coils. While this overall system is much more complex, they give the best overall control. In the case of these units, door opening events have far more impact on product temperature than the defrost process itself. In the end, these two types of freezers are fundamentally different on how they remove ice but are essentially cooled in the same manner. The only difference is how they move the air in the cabinet to contact the coils and how they remove ice buildup. Natural air circulation versus forced air circulation. Manual ice removal versus injected heat ice removal. In another session, we'll go through how these two systems perform and which may be best for you. Thank you.